Hello everybody, welcome to Lee Wine TV. I'm Hello everybody, welcome to Lee Wine TV. I'm Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm your host Mark Fusco here for another special edition of the show. I'm here with uh, Will Craigie. Did I say it right? You did. Perfect. Um, over here at Left Coast Cellar? Or just Left Coast Estate? Left Coast Estate. Left Coast Estate, there we go. Um, uh, and down here, I think it's the middle part of Will Emmett? Yeah, we're yeah. Central Valley, absolutely. Central, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so he just took me around the property. We popped into um, the winery itself and a nice little cellar. We'll get to that in a little bit. And um, so we'll want you to go ahead and uh, kind of introduce yourself and sure. tell us how did you get into this? Excellent. So my name is Will Craigie. I'm the hospitality director here at Left Coast. And I came to the Willamette Valley early in 2017 to be a part of this amazing wine industry that's here. Yeah. Um, one of the big draws just to the valley in general was just the overwhelming community aspect of it. It's a, it's a very supportive industry. It's a very welcoming place. And that's very apparent the minute you go start venturing around the valley and tasting wines. It's everybody's happy to see you, um, and you're it's uh, you're always welcomed with open arms when, yeah. when you're when you're out and about and being in the valley. Um, this property itself always stood out in the back of my brain. You know, when we first moved here, we of course went around the valley tasting wines, um, learning the lay of the land a little bit, and just the sheer beauty of this property was something that always really stuck with me in the back of my brain. Um, it's about a 500 acre estate. Okay. Um, with about 150 acres of grapes. So lots of big open spaces out in between the vineyards. Um, the wines are absolutely fantastic. The hospitality here is great. Um, a fun bonus is on the weekends as we do wood-fired pizzas. Yeah. And so that's a, that's a nice big draw for the valley, mm -hmm. you know, especially out here in wine country, there's not a lot of dining options. So that's uh, definitely something that brings folks into the tasting room. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, a nice network of hiking trails that run through the property. So it's a, it's a kind of a destination place. You can come out here and spend the day, um, come in, grab a pizza for lunch, grab a bottle of wine, uh, enjoy yourself for a little bit. And then you can go for a hike out through the, through the Oak forest and, uh, really, really take in, take in the property. Yeah. Very nice. Um, so you started here in, in uh, you said, what, uh, came out here in 17. Sure. And I started here at left coast at the beginning of this year, the yeah. end of February. Um, and then what got you here? What, what made you decide to leave where you're from? <laughs> sure. So I was managing a winery in Illinois, uh, Southwest places, Illinois. Yeah. yeah. Um, the, the heart of the wine world. I, I fully understand. Um, but yeah, so the, uh, the initial trip was out here in 2015 and it was a purchasing trip for my previous job. And the minute we were getting on the plane to fly back to Illinois, I said, we don't want to go back to Illinois. We want to stay here in Oregon. Yeah. Um, it's a, a magical place. It's green year round. Um, there's various transitions of green from the vineyards to the oak forest to the, all the grass seed farms around the valley. And so it's, it's always a constant changing landscape, but there's always something here is always green year round. Yeah. And it's just a beautiful place. It's a very temperate climate. Um, yeah, there's lots of reasons to be here. Um, cool. And Pinot Noir happens to be one of my one of my go-to wines, so it was kind of a natural landing spot for my wife and I. Very nice. And we were, when we were talking, you say you're from Texas too, right? I am, yep. Born yeah. and raised in Texas, grew up down on the Gulf Coast. Um, went to school in the Dallas-Fort Worth area at University of North Texas. Um, got into music, played live music for six or seven years. Spent most of that time um, touring around the southwest part of the country. And like most musicians, you have odd jobs in restaurants along the way. And that's where I really jumped into the food and wine world. Okay. And um, saw that that was something that could be a, you know, a viable career and you can actually earn an honest living by, by uh, being in the wine business. And so yeah. that was uh, definitely what brought us out here was being, being in a very well-respected, um, mature wine industry. Yeah, very nice. So talk to me about the history of the property here in the winery. How do they, how sure. do they get everything started? So um, Bob and Suzanne, the founders, moved out from Colorado and they purchased this property in 2003. Um, there was a small little planting of grapes on the property when they purchased it. 
uh, about 15 acres, and the, the original property was uh, about 325 acres. Okay. Um, it had been apple orchards and pear orchards in the past, and so there was land that was cleared that was ready to have something else put into it, um, and then scattered about all the open areas on the land are the oak forest. Um, so Bob and Suzanne got the property in 2003. Um, 2004 was the first year that those young vines were uh, had any viable fruit on them to make a little bit of wine. So 2004 was the first year making wine off of this property. 05 was when the tasting room opened. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's a family-run place. Uh, Suzanne is, uh, she spends a lot of time out in the market doing appearances at, uh, you know, wine dinners, trade shows, doing uh, going out on calls with uh, reps around the or, or in different markets around the country. Yeah. Um, Bob is spends as much time here on the property as he can. He's an avid home chef. Um, he's a master gardener as well. And so um, between Bob and then their daughter Callie, who Callie's now a landscape architect, um, but has always been into uh, into plants and gardening, and it's mm -hmm. kind of a, been a family passion. Um, so that's, they get credit for the layout for the grounds that we have, which are just absolutely spectacular. Um, our crew is incredible. They do, they work their tails off year round to keep this place looking sharp. Um, but yeah, so the gardens are all nicely laid out. So there's color throughout the year. Um, we also have a pretty extensive vegetable program as well. Okay. Um, so with the with the in-house cafe, we try to grow as many of the fresh produce things here on site as we can. Yeah, I saw um, that we were driving. I saw like a garden. Yeah, so we've yeah. got we've got a raised bed up there that um, we've had. Um, we've got a couple strawberry patches in there. We've got a few other berry crops. We've done uh, no, tomatoes, peppers. Um, this summer, we actually put in a hoop house for vegetables. Um, we kind of missed the window this year on getting things planted in there, but um, next spring we're really going to be able to seriously expand our farm to table operations okay. um, with all of our salad greens, all of our herbs, tomatoes, peppers, radishes, shallots, um, garlic. Um, so much of those kinds of, uh, you know, farm stand vegetables yeah. we'll be able to actually grow here on site. Okay. Um, so yeah, that's the... Um, and you get chickens and ducks. We have chickens and ducks. Um, we use the eggs here for the cafe. We also have them packaged and our wine club members, uh, they'll come out here for the weekend and grab a pizza, a bottle of wine and a dozen eggs and uh, right, cool. take that back home with them. So we've got chickens and ducks that are part of the family. So that's part of the daily routine is going out, letting, the, letting them out of the house, taking up whatever scraps we've got from the cafe the day before. Yeah. And um, yeah, keeping, keeping the chickens and ducks happy. <laughs> Right, yeah, the chickens, the chickens came out to see me, but the ducks, they didn't want to see me. Yeah, the ducks, ducks take a little more prodding to get uh, out sometimes. I heard them, but they, they, were, they were like, <laughs> I ain't coming outside. Um, so then we drove, um, we drove kind of around uh, some of the back end of the property, and uh, then we kind of settled into a kind of a little higher end so I could uh, do some drone stuff, and that's, sure. that's the perfect time for me to put the drone footage in. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but um, so kind of describe that that back area, which is actually where the drone first went. Sure. Uh, we have the vineyards that are back there. Okay. So the, um, the like I said, the original property was about 325 acres or so, mm -hmm. and the first big expansion that the family was able to get done was acquiring that block of uh, dirt that we went and drove through. The um, property used to belong to a grass seed farmer. Okay. And it was a beautiful rolling hills with this absolutely beautiful green grass in there twice a year. And Bob and Suzanne used to stand in the back corner of the property and they'd be looking at that grass seed field like, man, I wish we could plant some grapes back there one day. Well, it turns out that the owner of the grass seed farm was looking to sell some of his land and said, man, I sure would wish I could find somebody to buy this land so I go buy a beach house in Lincoln City. <laughs> so it worked out perfect. Both families were able to fulfill their dreams. And so that vineyard has become named the Field of Dreams Vineyard. Okay. Um, so it also coincides with some of the, um, I won't say experimental, but not, um, not ordinary plantings that are here in the valley. We've got um, about seven acres of Pinot Meunier up there that we mm -hmm. use for our sparkling program, as well as a full still red. And then we also have Syrah up there. We have Viognier. Um, so just, you know, varietals that are not unheard of, but certainly not common around yeah. the valley. And you're telling me that you, uh, with that Syrah and Viognier, that you're doing like cone fermentation. You're basically doing cone rotis style. Cone yep, fermentation. absolutely. Yeah. So we um, put the put the Viognier right into the pool with the Syrah and let all the kids play together and yeah. really help with that color extraction, give it some great aromatics as well. Yeah, yeah. very nice. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
The, one of the other uh, things that we drove by best there was our truffle orchard. So yeah. we've got um, some hazelnut trees here on the property that we could absolutely care less about the hazelnuts. Um, the roots of those trees when they were babies were inoculated with French Perigord truffles. So we are farming non-native truffles here on the property. Um, there are native Oregon white and black truffles that are absolutely delicious, but the Perigords just bring a little bit different flavor profiles to them. And so that's something that we're um, in the process of, and we're kind of getting to the point where it's the light at the end of the tunnel. We're, uh, we're getting close to within the next couple of years, we ought to be able to start pulling truffles out of the ground up there and yeah. be able to use them here in the cafe. So yeah, so you were pointing out like, like the picture I did take, um, the, the right around that ground when you start seeing the, the green kind of go away. Sure, yeah. So it's called a brulee. Um, mm -hmm. and it's basically the grass dies off. And so as that um, underground network of mycelium kind of gets developed and the, um, the truffles start, the, the spores start spreading, it actually pulls nutrients out and enough to kill the grass that's above that. So around the base of those trees, the little bald area is a great visual indicator that good things are happening underneath okay. the, underneath the soil. Nice. So, so I so I went from Field of Dreams on the drone, and then I, then I kind of went across, and there was another vineyard over there. What was what so was that? Over was the there? Truffle Hill Vineyard? Okay. Um, and so that's uh, where a lot of our Vadensville clone Pinot Noir is. There's also a tiny little bit of Pomard mm -hmm. in there, um, and that's one of the single vineyard designate bottlings of Pinot that we do is okay. the Truffle Hill Pinot. All right. And then ended up going over the forest. Yep, came yeah. over the over the oak forest. And that's a big part of what we've got going on here at Left Coast is our oak forest restoration project. Um, there's a big push in the valley, um, and it's actually called the Oregon Oak Accord. And um, the stands of the old growth Oregon white oak trees have really been um, taken a taken some some damage from the from the dawn of modern agriculture um, really moving up into the foothills here um, on the west side of the valley and so there's a big push in the valley to protect any stands of old growth trees that you have um, so part of the accord is you know it can be as small as four or five trees but if you're gonna do do your your part and protect that little micro environment there then you can sign on to the Oregon Oak Accord here at Left Coast, we're up to 100 acres just on this property that we've gone through and not just protected those trees, but we've um, reconverted that back into the oak savanna habitat, which used to be the transition from the Doug fir forest of the coastal range down to the valley floor. So it all used to just be big oak savannas, big uh, white oak trees, tall grasses, wildflowers. Mm -hmm. um, and so by reestablishing that oak savanna, we're really expanding um, a green belt here that we're about three miles away from the Basket Slough Wildlife Refuge. And so we're trying to piggyback off of that and really um, expand that green belt and, and re reintroduce that native habitat. Um, that's also a part of the live certification that, that we have here on the property is okay. um, farming practices um, is part of it, but a big part of it is just your ecological compensation areas and making sure that um, there's lots of natural areas on the property where you still have wildlife coming through and you still have the migratory birds that come through. Um, and you're creating a healthy environment and it's not monoculture. And that's the biggest thing that yeah. we're trying to avoid is we want to be sure that we're creating a, a healthy, happy environment here that we're putting more into the ground every year than what we're taking out by our farming. Yeah, and I've seen that, you know, it, it looks, uh, you can see there's a diversity of things that are going on here um, with not just grapes, sure. you know, and you've got, you've got the forest, you've got the garden, you've got, you've got the, the animals. You said that during the winter you have uh, you have you know um, natural lawnmowers. Yeah, that's right. So <laughs> our, our our neighbors bring over their herd of sheep, and we uh, move the sheep around out through the vineyard blocks, and so they act as the uh, the yard crew. They do all the mowing of the grass all winter long for us, and as they're wandering around, they're fertilizing in the process. Yeah. And um, so we use cover crops out in between the rows. So we um, uh, right now we've got a, a mix of oats and fetch and uh, crimson clover. This past spring it was predominantly all crimson clover. Uh, the, the photos from the spring were spectacular. Just every other row was just really deep, mm -hmm. dark crimson red, really, really beautiful, but big nitrogen maker. And right. so um, by using the cover crops and rotating those out, we're um, avoiding using man-made fertilizers, things yeah. of that nature. And then uh, you you take the the used grapes, uh, make, use it for compost, That's right. and then so even stuff from the cafe. Everything that comes out of the, uh, out of the presses, all the pumice, all the seeds, mm -hmm. that all goes into the compost pile. All of our food scraps from the cafe goes into the compost pile, as well as feeding the chickens and the ducks. So, yeah, absolutely. Very cool. So, um, and then uh, I, I made the drone go over the forest, and then there was like a little depression. And I was that so I can't remember. Was that some of the Chardonnay? Yeah, we sure. drove by so that. Right? Um, yeah. The Chardonnay is kind of on the backside of Truffle Hill, mm -hmm. and then um, there's Chardonnay, Pinot Blanc, and um, then there's another big block of uh, Dijon Pinot right okay, there as yeah. well. 
Yeah. Um, yeah. The, so the the Syrah and the Viognier are uh, mostly up there at the entrance to Field of Dreams, and then we have one other block of Syrah over on the Right Bank Vineyard, which is our our larger planting of Pomard. Okay. Um, so it sits up on top of kind of a southwest facing slope. Gets that nice intense afternoon sun, so we can be sure we get at least one block of it ripe every year. Okay. Speaking of sun, when I drive in, there's solar panels. So yeah. tell me about that. So left coast is largely powered by the sun. Um, the the array that you saw um, on the drive in mm -hmm. that powers the gate, it powers the pump house, and it powers Bob and Suzanne's cottage that's uh, right up there behind that vineyard. Okay. And then on top of the production building is a much larger display. Um, so total, we're about 83 kilowatts of solar power um, here on the property. And right now that uh, that accounts for about 80 to 85 percent of the power that we use every year. Okay. Um, in 2022, I believe, is when we're eligible to apply for another grant to expand the solar panels. Um, when the panels originally went in, we were in the upper 90 percentile range of you know producing almost as much power as we use every year. But over the years, business has grown, energy demands have grown. We keep watering the solar panels, but they have not grown any yet. So, yeah. But when we can get around to getting another grant, then we'll be able to expand that panels and hopefully get back up into that mid to upper 90 percent solar Perfect. powered range. All right. I think this might be a good time to uh, dive into some wine here. Sure. So we will start off with our white Pinot Noir. All right. Yes. So, um, so while he's pouring this, so when we, we went into the actual first, well, not first, we're going to go a little back. We went to the winery and we went somewhere else first, but because we're, we're doing this. And uh, so I got to see all that. And uh, I mistakenly, I'm going to talk about me being an idiot. Uh, I'm not going to, maybe I'll show that video too. I swear the so they had the the open top the smaller open top fermenters uh, that are empty. I thought there was stuff in there, and I swear that the little covers, one of them moved. So that's kind of cool. It's fermentation going on. It's going up and down. It wasn't anyway. So we, I got to see that, and then um, uh, and then I asked if we could do some uh, samples um, from fermentation. So I actually got to sample some. Actually, two different ones, right? Yeah, two different so blocks, two, two of, the, different of, blocks of, of this. Yeah, of the white Pinot Noir. So, kind of tell me about white Pinot Noir. It's, it's kind of a niche thing. It is. It's really become one of our flagships. Yeah. Um, so, it started off in 2011. Um, 2011 was kind of the summer that never happened here in the Willamette Valley. It was cold and wet and rainy mm -hmm. most of the season. And, you know, harvest is usually end of September, beginning of October. In 2011, a lot of people still had fruit hanging into November. And, Winemakers, of course, are getting a little nervous. So what do you do with a bunch of high acid, you know, a little bit um, underripe fruit? It's like, well, you make bubbles out of it. So we started, decided to begin a traditional champagne method sparkling wine program in 2011. And so this white Pinot Noir actually started out as the base wine for the, for the sparkling. Okay. Um, we left it in a tank for about four months, stirred up the leaves every once in a while to create a little bit of richness, a little bit of texture in the wine, and then bottled it off. Just did a couple hundred cases just to see how it would go, and it sold out kind of overnight. Um, so production has been increased every year since then, and it's uh, blossomed into our number two production wine. Uh, we still sell out of it every year before we get to the next vintage. Yeah. We've even created one little section of the wine club that is just the white Pinot Noir club. Oh, wow. The discount only applies to this one wine, and it's basically just an allocation to be sure that people get their case of white Pinot for the year. Okay. Um, so yeah, it's a really fun wine. It's got lots of great kind of um, subtropical fruit components to it. Um, less than one gram per liter of residual sugar, but it's still got great fruit. Um, it's a great summertime wine. Um, my wife and I eat a lot of Thai food, and this has really become our Thai food go-to. Okay. It works really, really well with balancing out a little bit of that spice. Um, yeah, really fun Pinot. Yeah, it's yeah, it's not sweet, but it's got that it's got that fruit quality to it. So I, you know, when you're eating something spicy, it's definitely going to help tame that spiciness. I mean, I, I'm not going to kiss you atomic buffalo wings or anything. Like no, that. no, no. But yeah, if you have just enough of a kick on there, um, so. That transitions into we went into that little cellar that's right where all the uh so we've got an underground the, yeah. sparkling cave yeah um it's a it's a man-made underground concrete room but it's uh what we have is a extended tirage program aging in our cave so starting in 2012 we set back 10 cases from every vintage of traditional champagne style bubbles that we have done and we're doing a 10 year extended tirage experiment on those. So beginning in 2022, mm -hmm. we'll pull a few cases off of the 2012 um, riddling rack 
disgorge those, finish them off, and then uh, begin building an extended tirage tasting program. Okay. Um, so yeah, just something that's uh, really fun to do, something that's uh, definitely gonna be uh, some really cool tasting experiences in the future when, once that program all comes online. Okay. Um, definitely an exercise in patience, but it's gonna be really cool when we get there. So you maybe you've implied it, maybe you talked about it with, with, with that. So you pulled 10 cases of, of that, of the, um, I guess the 12, right? Mm -hmm. So have you, I assume that you've been adding to that so you can have that, that rotating Correct. tenure. Okay. Absolutely. Yep. It, it should have been implied, but I yes. just want to make sure that yes. was like, so yeah. <laughs> 10 years of every vintage of sparkling we have right. set back. Okay. 10 Thank cases you said of. that. All right. <laughs> All right. Um, so that was cool. So I've actually never seen that the riddling apparatus, I can't remember what it was called. Um, the riddling racks. Yeah, riddling racks. Mm -hmm. Never seen them like in person. You know, I've, uh, I've seen what... I've seen champagne production, so I went to Albuquerque during a, a visit to West Texas. I know it doesn't sound like that's sure, but that's what happened. And I went to Gruet, and mm -hmm. I saw everything that's involved with uh, sparkling wine production, yep. including the Euro palettes. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the big, massive things that I got to see them up close and personal. Whereas in, in Bone, I went to Vu Van Ball, and I got to see theirs, oh, cool. you know, too. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so I've never seen the actual like old school stuff. So that's really nice. Yeah, so for the first uh, three years of the traditional method program, we actually hand riddled all of it. Um, the program has grown, and so it's uh, out of the scale of being done by hand at mm -hmm. this point. But uh, for the first three years of the traditional method bubbles, they were they were all hand riddled as well. So back to this wine, it's like I said, it's got some good fruit to it. Um, it's got some apple, some pear. I think it's also to me, it's got a little bit of peach to it. Sure. So we got a little. Palm fruit and tree fruit. Um, they're all tree fruit, but there's a, there's a distinction between the two. Um, and you know, the the two different lots. You know, they were actually some, they're actually kind of, to me they were distinctive. Um, mm -hmm. One had more of the caramel apple, a little butterscotch, and the other lot had, didn't really have it, but still had more of that that pomaceous fruit to it. Sure. Um, so it was really cool to taste those. Those were still going through fermentation. Um, I don't know how much longer. Like they were about four bricks. They're about four said. bricks, yeah. So not much longer. Not, not a whole lot longer to go on those. Um, and they were um, the lots were from different spots on the property and different yeah. clonal um, mixes as well. And so that's uh, would definitely lead to the variation in the in the two yeah. tanks. It was really nice. Um, and then I did. Uh, you're able to pour off a little Pinot Gris for me, mm -hmm. um, and that was really nice. And then. Some Pinot Noir that had finished fermentation. Just finished primary fermentation. Yeah. Yep. So, uh, so that's the first I've ever done. I've never had a Pinot directly out of the fermentation tank. This also to go through malolactic. Yeah. You can get into a barrel. So, unbarreled, non-mallow Pinot, and it was really fresh. It was kind of like a, a Pinot Nouveau, sure. so so to speak. Uh -huh. You know. Absolutely. It's uh, it's fun to taste things in the stages of the process, right. and then uh, it really kind of opens your eyes to the finished product and how you actually go about getting there. Um, and that's something that, you know, I don't, I don't taste a lot of either is something, especially that Pinot specifically, because mm -hmm. you usually, when you're going through sampling, you're doing barrel samples. And so it's at least partially through mallow. It's got a little bit of wood on it, you know, and so having it straight out of just that first primary tank is, you know, that's, that's a pretty cool tasting. It's also first for you too. Yeah. I, I've that's not cool. done that here yet. All Absolutely. right. Well, I'm glad I asked then. Um, so let's move on to, um, the next wine. Sure. The next Pinot. Uh, move into red pinot. This is the Truffle Hill Pinot Noir. Okay. So as we mentioned, the Truffle Orchard that we have up there, that is the location of this block of fruits. And these are all Vadensville clones okay. of Pinot. Um, Vadens yeah, you, yeah. So kind of talk to me about the Vadensville uh, clone itself. Sure. So it's a Swiss German clone. Um, it really likes our cool climate that we have here in the valley. Um, to me, Vadensville brings a lot of those really nice earthy components of a Pinot Noir. Um, it's a little of a darker fruit component as well. Mm -hmm. um, on the other side of Salem is Silver Falls State Park, and there's an amazing eight mile hike that will take you around 10 waterfalls. And if you go out there this wow. time of year, especially in these cool wet mornings, all those kind of forest floor, mushroomy, wet stone things, that's what Vadensville is to me. And so this is, that's my brain always goes to that park whenever I open up this bottle of wine. 
Wow, that makes me want to do that instead of going over to Tillamook <laughs> or try to make out to, to not Fort Hood, Mount Hood. Fort is in Texas. <laughs> um, a bit of a drive to get to Fort Hood <laughs> yeah, from here. <laughs> yeah, uh, to Mount Hood. Uh, that, so my weekend is dedicated to doing just whatever I feel like, but that sounds kind of cool too. Anyway. Yeah, it's cool. And so, uh, like I said, it's called Truffle Hill because we are farming non-native truffles up there. Mm -hmm. um, this also happens to be the bottle of Pinot that we have that to me goes best with mushroomy truffley dishes. When I'm talking about food behind the tasting bar, this is my big pot of mushroom risotto Pinot. And if you want to put some uh, some animal protein on it, pan sear duck breast and then slice that real thin and lay it over the top of the risotto. If it happens to be truffle season, then you start shaving fresh truffles over the top of all of it and it just keeps getting happier and happier. And, yeah. Uh, I can definitely see all that in here. I mean, you still have really good fruit. Um, it's a broken record for this series of, of um, interviews, but you know, it's, it's good marriage between you know old and new world. You still got the new world fruit forwardness to it, but you're still getting that the earthiness to it. Um, I can totally see the truffle side. I can even see a little bit of like, and maybe it's just because stuff I've had recently with cheeses, but I could see like a little bit of like a an aged cheese in here sure. somewhere absolutely like that you know maybe it looks more like the um the rind okay you know where where the um so you get that earthiness also from, from certain cheeses that have like the 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 yeast and all that i forgot what they call it but the rind part yeah mm -hmm. that you can get like some of that that kind of quality from it and so let me be clear because some of you who are natural wine people might say that's mouse this is not mouse. I know what mouse tastes like because I had it about a week ago. Mm -hmm. I kind of liked it, but that's kind of like the new toy. Right. It was kind of cool, kind of interesting. It was very cheesy. This is not that. So <laughs> just so we're clear, um, it just kind of reminded me of like some cheeses I'd had recently, whereas mouse is very, very pronounced. Sure. And I'd never had ever smelled or tasted that. So um, that's, a, that's a subject for a different podcast or a different episode of what, how that comes about. But... But yeah, this is also could be just some of the aromas might be coming in. Sure, yeah. From so the, the, cafe. the wood fired oven is getting fired up. Greg's back there doing pizza prep for the yeah. weekend, so the, that's uh, that's all going on. Um, but it, it Carolyn's all... Carolyn's making pot pies for the winery crew yeah. for, for lunch. So yeah, the, it all it all contributes to it. And it's all and it's, it it works really well. Like I could imagine like drinking some of this with some of that stuff. Which I haven't decided if I'm going to hang out here for Panini or you t you gave me a suggestion of a place yeah, uh, over in Amity. Blue Goat up in Amity. That was a really nice so, job. They've also got a cool cob oven in there that's wood-fired. That okay. They do some cool stuff as well. Yeah. yeah. For sure. It's got some really bright. It's got some good acidity to it. Um, you know, it's, it's a really delicious wine. So thank you very much for pulling some of that. Absolutely. Um, that's my go-to for the single vineyard Pinots that we have. We do three bottlings of it. Okay. The Latitude 45 is all Dijon clones. Okay. It's uh, four different clones. Um, and that's all one block of grapes that's right inside the gate, the oldest block of grapes on the property. We do a right bank bottling as well. Our right bank vineyard is all Pomard clones. Okay. So a little more body, a little more grip, a little more structure. That's kind of my steak Pinot. If you're looking for a Pinot to go with the steak, that one will fill the bill. And then the Truffle Hill. Okay. Um, the Cali's Cuvée Pinot is the multi-clonal blend. That's about half of our production every year, and that's the wine that goes out and sees lots of different markets. Okay, and travels for us. Then that's that's probably the one I'm more familiar with. Um, so, kind of, you, I don't remember during the tour when we were driving around if you explained what the left and right bank actually are for you guys. Sure. Um, so there's um, the property is on a series of little foothills coming out of the coastal range, and then there's a, a few little hills that have been popped up before you get down to the valley floor. And um, if you look at a flood map of where the Missoula flood um, waters came when that all came down through Idaho and through the Columbia River Gorge and backwashed and filled this whole valley up, mm -hmm. um, as the water is coming down, you can see on the map, um, there's this one little series of hills and off to, it was coming south, so it would have been to the right of the flow, but as we're sitting on the property, that's what we call our left bank. Okay. Um, that is where our... Um, Pinot Blanc, and um, we've got a little bit of Pinot Noir over there as well, and Pinot Gris are in that portion of the property. So it's a left bank of the property coming down as you're okay. looking up where all this water came in. Okay. On the right bank um, is the other side of that little trough. And so it's kind of just from the 
from the production building as you're looking up towards that water flow. It's the left right. bank of the water flow and the right bank of the water flow. Okay. Um, also, that uh, something kind of cool that is on the property that we didn't get over to is we've got one of the, I think it's, we've been told it's the second largest erratic rock here in Oregon on our property. So the erratic rocks were big hunks of granite that were frozen in icebergs that came down during the Missoula floods. So non-native rocks that are just kind of plopped along this side okay. of the valley. Um, and there's about two thirds of it is sticking up out of the ground. And we've had some, um, some geologists out here and they think that there's, um, uh, it's about a 65,000 pound hunk of granite is sitting in oh, wow. between two trees down there in front of Bob and Suzanne's cottage. Oh man. And so it's, it's funny, Suzanne will tell a story of being, uh, being in the cottage one Saturday morning drinking coffee and then she hears a bunch of little kids' voices out there. And there was a school bus that pulled up and they were doing, they just kind of did an impromptu tour <laughs> in, in their front yard. And so she came out and told the little stories in her nightgown and went back inside. Just, there you go. But yeah, you know, it's a, uh, um, so that was um, kind of a cool little visual of how those things, how the, how the Missoula flood actually happened and um, you know our elevation goes from about 225 up to a little over 500, 525. Mm -hmm. Most of the Missoula flood soils stop around 400, 450. Um, so we do have a little bit of topsoil that's Missoula floods, but underneath where all the roots of the grapevines are, this is all marine sedimentary soil. Things used to be on the bottom of the ocean floor that have been pushed up over time. Um, so when they're out there digging pits or putting in new rows, um, they're bringing up rocks and on those rocks, they'll have little seashell fossils and things okay. like that. Yeah. It's pretty cool to see. Yeah. Very nice. Very nice. Um, shall we move on to, move on to the last one? Last one. So a, one of the stars of the Field of Dreams vineyard also has a little home up on top of Right Bank. We've got two acres of Syrah here on the property. Again, a not standard planting for the Willamette Valley, but there are more than a handful of people that have small plantings of it. Um, a really fun, really pretty varietal that in a cool climate version of it is really, really expressive of where it's grown. Um, Syrah Noir is the specific clone of Syrah that uh, we are growing here. And we've got the roti designate on the label. We do this in homage to Coke roti. So we, mm -hmm. like we said, we co-ferment Viognier with the Syrah. Um, crazy little enzymatic thing that Viognier does the Syrah helps pull color out of the skins. Also gives some great aromatics to the wine as well. Um, but the biggest difference between this and a warmer climate Syrah is this is very nuanced. It's very layered. There's lots of little textural things that happen as the wine opens up and as you're playing with it in your glass. And it's, um, it's a really, really fun expression of Syrah that catches people off guard a little bit because they're, uh, they, they'll, some folks are a little hesitant to try it because I will, well, the Valley shouldn't be growing Syrah. It's like, well, you know, there's little pockets where it works and we've got a couple of those little pockets here on the property. And this is an absolutely beautiful wine. I love this wine. <laughs> I'm not saying these wines are, are aren't good. They're really good, but I think it's just because I've I've been drinking so much Pinot Noir right in the last like five days I've been here to have like an Oregon wine that's not Pinot Noir or Chardonnay. Mm -hmm. Sure, it's you know, just and, and but there's but there's definitely a different quality to it, and um, I can see that you know it's 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 not that big like juicy. Uh, first of all, it's not Shiraz. Mm -hmm. But even from the Rhone, it's not the really big, bold, like a Cornas Syrah sure. that's just going to rip your, your face off yep, type of thing. Um, this very, is like... Very reserved, know, a little yeah. just subtle, um, but some, some elegance to it. Yep, yeah, absolutely. You got the great spices on it, you know, the great pepper and all that. Um, the Viognier. Now, if I was drinking this, would I sit there and go, I, I can taste the Viognier? Probably not, but since I know there's Viognier in it, I know it's giving it some extra lift because mm -hmm. that's what Viognier does with Syrah. That's why they co-ferment it. That's why, why they do what they do uh, in the Rhone. But um, there is definitely a, a little bit of lift and freshness to it. Absolutely. Um, like I said, would I normally be like, oh, this must have Viognier in it? Mm -hmm. Probably not. Right. I'd probably say Syrah and just move on. Sure. And maybe just kind of think it's just like really yeah, cool. but it's almost like there's a kind of a breath of fresh air on the back end of it, and yeah. that's what I really think the VNA brings to the table. Um, you know, a little bit of floral stuff on the nose, mm -hmm. but once again, if you didn't know it was in there, it probably wouldn't stand out to you. But it's something that just it's texturally really, really lightens this wine up. Right. Yeah. Exactly. This is spectacular. I like this wine a lot. Um, is there anything that maybe did we go through that we should probably chat about? 
Well, the other thing you saw in the production building was we've got a couple concrete eggs. Oh, that's right, yes. So we do do some fun ferments with the concrete <laughs> eggs. Um, we generally will rotate vintages between Chardonnay and Pinot Blanc. Um, we have uh, one specific clone of Chardonnay that's called Musquet that does really, really well in the concrete eggs. It's a very okay. floral, very pretty clone of Chard. Um, and so we do primary ferment as well as the aging in the eggs. So it's in there for eight to 10 months and then the two eggs get blended together in a tank and then into the bottle it goes. So, you know, there's very little time outside of the egg before it gets to the bottle. Um, and then we've also done a reserve level of our white Pinot Noir in the concrete eggs. Um, and again, because of that cool little vortex that the egg creates, it keeps those leaves suspended the whole time, creates some great texture and richness to the wine that you don't get in a standard shape of a fermenter. Right. And then the concrete brings a little bit of minerality to the party. And then um, for the reserve white pinot, we actually put a quarter of that juice into a, a punch in a double-sized oak barrel um, for about eight months. And um, again, created a little more layers of richness and texture. So very, very different from the flagship, but an equally cool expression of, of white pinot. Yeah. Very nice. Yeah, that was, I totally forgot about that. And I, I mean, I took a little footage of that too. I was like, there's eggs. I don't know, I don't know what it is about concrete eggs. I just, every time I see them, I think it's just like kind of cool. And it's, I think it's just because they're not as widely used really sure. anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I have seen a couple of them yep. in my visit here. They're, they're becoming more popular around the valley. I mean, there's a few places that have several of them. Yeah. Most places have one or two. Yeah, that's, that's usually what yep. I see. Mm -hmm. If I go to a place, they have like one, two, maybe. Yep. And it's like kind of expensive somewhat experimental sure like really niche mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff um but yeah that was that was able that was to cool do to see that. able to do fun kind of one-off bottlings that are you know kind of wine club exclusives or yeah. just out of the tasting room you know just small production things that are that are a lot of fun and um uh, just creating a little more a little more interest and uh, variation in the brand yeah um so since we are in the tasting room we just mentioned that um what are your hours normally for the tasting room? tasting room is noon to five every day of the week okay um we have a wood-fired oven which i think we alluded to earlier that mm -hmm. we do wood-fired pizzas on the weekends which are absolutely killer we do the dough from scratch the sauce from scratch um, we use as many fresh pro produce things off of the state as we can um, and then during the week we have a little panini menu and we do charcuterie boards um, and we make focaccia bread out of our leftover pizza dough so we do serve okay. that during the week as well nice yeah. um and then uh you may have alluded to it, but everything's 100% estate as far as the wine. 100% estate, yeah. that's right. Everything we make wine out of, we grow here ourselves on site. Cool. So we don't buy any fruit from anybody else. Um, we'd sell just a teeny tiny little bit of fruit, but pretty much everything we grow stays here on the property and uh, mm -hmm. goes into our bottles. All right, cool. I think we may have covered everything. Awesome. <laughs> All right. Um, so folks, uh, we're going to wrap this up. Um, I know he's got to get the tasting room open here in a little bit. And because um, that's where we're at, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that gives me the incentive to finish on time or a little bit early, actually. And um, so, thank you so much for pleasure. Absolutely, you know, thank you so much for visiting time us and um, allowing me to like check everything out. And uh, incredible drone footage, from, at least from what I saw on the phone. Yeah, I, I cannot wait to like get get back to the Airbnb to like look at the original. And um, I'll no beautiful day. I'll give you well. guys the the raw cool. footage of that. Awesome. Um, so, um, but yeah, so anyway, so we're going to wrap this up here. Thank you all for stopping by. Click the links above to friend me up. Uh, I'll have a link below for uh, the winery and we'll see everyone again next time.